the primary regulatory network. And uh, the only other person I hear talk about it is Bruce Perry. I mean, because he probably because he has a focus on early childhood development and his own work uh, with trauma and adverse childhood experiences, classroom uh, work, and also working with parents and caregivers. But this to me is fascinating. And I think it really speaks to why do we do expressive and sensory based work? Why do we think it's so effective? Why, you know, why not just have talk therapy? Because actually we develop our regulatory abilities well before we're born. Uh, so we're developing this network that involves movement and touch and rhythm. Uh, particularly touch is the first thing that starts up. And this is eight weeks after conception. So it begins to form this regulatory capacity in us. And if we get a solid primary regulatory network, before we're born and then in those first few years, it's a foundation for regulation throughout our lifespan. That is really a powerful thing. Now, this is why we have people coming to any kind of, um, you know, uh, therapy, uh, facilitation, coaching, all these different things. People may be missing this and we can start to work with it again. It's much better if we get it early on. Of course, everything is. If we form that really solid foundation in these areas that help us regulate through co-regulation with others, uh, because you know we are co-regulating at that point, even before we're born with the mother, and then eventually with parents, caregivers, and maybe even extended family or uh, others in our lives in those early years. But this is the foundation and I think like, okay, we're talking about things that we do in our work as expressive arts practitioners, movement, touch and rhythm. So we can always come back to these three things to you know, help us decide what our approach is in that moment with child, adolescent, caregiver, parent, whoever we're working with, any adult population, any community population. This all applies to that in terms of regulation. Oh, there we go, come on. Um, so this is just an interesting piece of research. Again, you know, you know just for your knowledge, uh, recent studies talking about synchrony and rhythm, that synchronizing to a beat predicts how well you get in sync with others. So it's good to practice rhythm. Uh, because studies show, and this is science looking at it, not therapy, not psychotherapy, not expressive arts, but looking at how people synchronize to a beat tells you how well they synchronize to another mind. So it's something actually you might innately have, but you can also practice it uh, and you can practice it with others. And you may find that a lot of people, uh, you know, and I, I've always said this to trauma survivors, a lot of times they indicate that they feel offbeat. They don't feel like their rhythm is good right now. And that possibly may be what we can do in the course of whatever we do together uh, in therapy, for example, is to practice some rhythms or find some good rhythms for them to get their good rhythms back in their life. So, uh, you know, how you're practicing synchrony and rhythm in your life and interactions with your clients actually is important too. We all need to kind of find that good rhythm too and practice being in sync with others because that's part of our work as expressive people or as therapists in general, as facilitators in general. So, so really interesting, just very simple study, basic science, but it tells us a lot about how humans really need to be in rhythm with each other and in sync. So here's another term, uh, you know, a fancy term for entrainment, which is rhythmic synchronization. And again, rhythm is this core foundation of expressive arts. Um, and really, it's one of these powerful things we can introduce to help people regulate and stabilize. It's also part of the whole area of synchrony being in sync with each other. So, you know, it's in communication with each other, this rhythmic synchronization. Any kind of entrainment and rhythm <clears throat> can help support good rhythms in others. So sometimes you find these words interchangeable. That's why I bring this up, entrainment, which means we're kind of getting to the same respiration, maybe, or heartbeat together. 
uh, movements together is a form of rhythmic synchronization. If you go to a concert, for example, um, again, people were deprived of this during the pandemic. You're hearing the same music together, you're seeing the same performance together, you start to entrain together. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth Warson, who works in equine therapy would say right now, similar thing can happen with horses. Being in proximity to a horse, start to entrain to that horse, that horse starts to entrain to you. So there's again, that synchronization can happen between sentient beings of any kind. So we're talking about human to human here, but it can be with therapy animals and equine therapy and other forms of sentient beings. So uh, there's three, actually three forms of regulation too, I wanted to mention here that entrainment, this rhythmic synchronization, helps with. One is self-regulation, so your own regulation of your body, co-regulating with others. And then we, we don't talk about this term too much, shared regulation. So in groups and communities, how we connect socially and attach to each other in that larger way. And that happens in, you know, one of the best examples, again, is going to attend an event where there is rhythm, where there's, um, you know, music or performance or something like that going on which, you know, not to get off on a tangent, takes us back to thousands of years of humans introducing rhythm in their rituals, not just because it's part of the ritual or the procedure, but also because of the entrainment of the community. So that shared regulation is really important. 